This program is part of a National Endowment for the Humanities series called Southern Art, Wider World. And you're seeing the maiden voyage of uh, this new virtual experience that we've put together. So we, there's a lot in store for you, in, including our special guest, Ralph Eubanks. But before we dive in there, um, Zaire, so yeah, this the theme of this one and every program this fall that we do is going to have a different theme, but it's about the landscape, real and imagined. And um, so I kind of wanted to see, just th throw this out to you. Let, let's shoot it for a minute about the landscape. I wonder when you started to realize that either the Mississippi landscape or the Southern landscape, when did it start to mean something to you? How old were you and, and how do you think about the land? I think when I began my filmmaking journey is when I really realized how much of an influence it had on me, me being from Memphis and my folks being from Sledge, Mississippi and just all over Mississippi. And um, just just seeing the landscape, the the very vast, you know, plains land where you can just like stand in, in the middle of the street and like see nothing for miles. Or, you know, you're walking past these huge trees where you know that they've been here for like generations and you wonder like, oh, if those trees could talk. And, you know, I have a short film called Trees with my grandmother. And I, I really believe when I made that short in 2018 is when I really began to see how much the landscape was very much so a part of who I am as a person and a artist. Yeah, For totally. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in the Delta and I, I try to think back. It's hard to put yourself in that place again, but I don't know that I realized because why would I, you know, as like a four year old, you know, where you're growing up. But when it's somewhere like the Delta, the, the most southern place on Earth, as it said, um, there's a lot of meaning that's just packed into your early existence. And I think our job and I know what, what Ralph will, Eubanks will say is is we're, we're constantly unpacking that history all through our lifetime. Uh, I want to shout out to the people out there. So if you're watching live, you know, like I said, the, the theme of this program is landscape. So drop a comment in there if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube and let us know where you're coming from. But but go ahead and chime in with your landscape. What's your real and imagined landscape? We want to hear from you. And um, and so, Zaire, tell me a bit about your landscape now, because you know you mentioned you've got Mississippi roots, but the landscape is not just this pastoral, bucolic, rolling fields. It's also cityscapes. And if you're down here, coastal waters. So how do you think about the landscape a little differently than that stereotypical vista? Yeah, I think now it is now that I, I live in Memphis. And so I'm in the city. I'm in like the downtown midtown area. So now, of course, I'm definitely I step away from like the country, the, the very like natural part of the landscape. And now it just allows me to now focus on the people who occupy this, you know, lands this landscape, you know, whether it be, you know, the the inner city or the suburbs and like how these people live and interact and 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 actually like I guess contribute to, you know, our land, our world, right? And so I, I think now in this moment when I don't have the not the opportunity, but but the landscape is different. Now I focus on different things, you know, instead of the, the grass and the trees, I'm looking at the person who's like walking out of the corner store. I'm looking, I'm, I'm watching the family who is at the park. And so I'm able to now see the people who occupy these spaces versus me like really honing in on um, the actual, you know, land. Yeah, for sure. And we got some people chiming in. So Holly's mm -hmm. coming from Stone County. We got Loosedale represented. We got Jackson, Mississippi. Got Atlanta coming in. There's Pat from Atlanta. Hey, Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got Pine Trees. That's a good a good place to be watching it from or, or to, to live in. And, and uh, you know, Walter Anderson and the Pine Tree is an important thing. And of course, Ocean Springs. And you know, maybe, maybe the imagined landscape is just all about love, as, as Bella says. So, um, <laughs> so look, y'all, uh, we've been shooting it with Zaire. She's going to come back and uh, you're, you'll see her work throughout the show. Um, but we're going to take um, take this time to actually dive in to our our fully fledged program. And, and we're going to hit it right now. Southern Art Wider World. Here we come. Yeah. 
It all starts the southern part of the map The influence, the globe, ain't nothing harder than that We way smarter in fact than the stories that you heard about us Determination and birth the image, we learn the progress It's all a process, rebuild and regrow When the value's much more than the silver and gold See the stories passed down through the soil and the dirt And we rose from the ashes so we loyal to the earth And we royal from our birth, see the beauty of the landscape Gulf Coast waters crashing on the sandbanks It's like a diamond but hitting in plain sight Gotta let the light shine, concealing it ain't right So I take my time, turn the page, make a line How I feel when I'm in the Mississippi state of mind Where the cotton grows high, yeah. The time moves slow, yeah. The river belongs just to get us so home to me All right, we're in it, y'all. This is Julian Rankin. I'm the director of the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. And thank you for joining us for this first in our fall series, Southern Art Wider World, National Endowment for the Humanities Supported Project, uh, additional support from the Mississippi Humanities Council and in partnership with the Center for the Su uh, Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. So we do have a, a distinguished guest business today, and we're going to be joined in a moment by Ralph Eubanks, who's a visiting professor of Southern Studies, English and Honors at the University of Mississippi. He's a, an author, recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship in, in 2007. He's held many posts, including um, editor of the Virginia Quarterly Review, and he was running uh, the Library of Congress uh, director of publishing for a while up in Washington, D.C., but we're, we're thrilled to have him in Mississippi, and he has his own Mississippi roots that you'll learn about very shortly, but we always want to ground these conversations in the collection. So the whole purpose of this project uh, through the National Endowment for Humanities is to delve into our collection and to give people a lens into Walter Anderson that they may not have understood before. And so to do that, we're going to take a trip before we meet Ralph into the vault. Everything for Walter Anderson was really coming back to this idea that the world was a magical place based on this lineage of fairy tales and folklore and mythology that were all around us. He saw every ditch as an opportunity for a dryad to burst from the waters. He looked at trees as potentials for uh, fairies and nymphs. Walter Anderson really wanted us to look at our landscapes and see in every tree, creek, stream, and street that there was a depth of history that went far beyond us, and there was also the boundless possibility for wonder. Mississippi is full of incredible storytellers, but Walter Anderson wanted us to see the landscape as one of its authors. All right, Ralph, we're joined by my brother uh, in bow tie wearing. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. And, you know, we're going to talk a lot about a lot of different things uh, this evening. But before we dive too deep into Anderson, I wanted to, to hear a bit from you, um, kind of ground us in, in your landscape and in, in your Mississippi. What, what, what do you how do you think about that? You I mean, your, your new book coming out, which is now available, A Place Like Mississippi, a, a Journey Through the Real and Imagined Literary Landscape, which we encourage people to, of course, get. Um, it delves into these very, very issues and ideas. So how do you begin to think about that? What's the thesis of that book? The thesis of that book is that uh, Mississippi writers use this landscape to, it's almost like their canvas. It's the, the real, they take real places and place their characters within those. They take the history of a place and use that as part of the history of their characters. Uh, that's, I think, probably one of the more contemporary writers who, who does that was the late Brad Watson, who took the town of Meridian and created this town of Mercury and, you know, had scenes that were along the Chunky River. He moves the Chunky River a little bit closer, but it's still there. So he's, he's taking that landscape, making it a little bit closer, putting it a little bit closer to the Gulf than it actually is. 
because he, as he told me, he said, that's how I really wish that it were. I wish I were a little bit closer to the Gulf growing up. So it's the, the thesis is that we begin, we usually think about Mississippi's literary landscape beginning in the Delta. And instead of beginning in the Delta, I begin in the Gulf Coast because I feel that the you know, two contemporary writers who are writing about the Gulf Coast, Natasha Trethewey and Jessamyn Ward, represent this new way of thinking about the landscape at Mississippi. So we begin the journey in on the Gulf Coast, traveling up through Natchez, Vicksburg, the Piney Woods, Jackson, and then Eastern Mississippi through those hills into Oxford and ending in the Delta. Um, and the last place where we visit in the Delta is Parchment. That's great. And and you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got a, a relationship with the Piney Woods that you write about um, in the book and you talk about in, in your writings. And, you know, I, I was struck by this connection you made uh, to Ireland. Um, you know, there, there is a certain familiarity with that landscape, but also Ireland is also a place of great mystery. And, you know, Anderson was fascinated with fairies mm -hmm. and and all of these um, kind of fantastical uh things. And, and uh, so tell me a bit about that. I mean, how, how do you think about Mississippi being a little bit of an analog for, for other areas? I didn't make that connection until I visited Ireland in my early 20s and was in County Sligo and looked out at the, these green hills and realized that these people who left there and came south, they were living in a very similar landscape. Uh, and also, there's a lot of, you know, Ireland has a tortured history, just as Mississippi does. And it's it's also a place that has produced a lot of writers who also take these imagined ideas about, about place, some of the mythology, and create story around it. And that's, so Mississippi and Ireland, uh, I think our, the residents of both places who end up writing about it are, find themselves very much immersed in it. And I mean, for me as a nonfiction writer, rather than a fiction writer, I'm very often dealing with history. So I, and in doing that and thinking about the stories that come out of Mississippi, I always say, explore the silences. And sometimes that silence comes out of the landscape. And then there's some aspect of that. And then using that landscape for me, at least to bring some clarity you know, Walter Anderson, uh, we, we know about Horn Island. So that was, you know, his his real landscape, but it also served as his imagined landscape. And, you know, that was in some ways his Eden. He went out there and, and was searching for new realities. And when he did so, it reminds me of, you know, of Richard Wright, who talks about this vague sense of the infinite when he's looking out from Natchez. But, you know, Anderson's talking about that island as almost being you know, like the back of Mo Moby Dick, the white whale or this magic carpet. And um, it reminds me of, of, of really all the different ways that that writers and artists create for us, you know, something that's that's new. Um, but also it's, it's it's redolent of what's real. And I wonder what you think about that heightened sense of reality. I mean, what's the function of that for us um, when we try to redefine our landscapes? Because the, the land is not really um, objectively anything. I mean, it doesn't mean culturally anything until we ascribe meaning to it. And that's what our artists and our authors uh, do for us. Yes, well, it is it is a way of finding meaning. It's also a way of making sense of the past. And nowhere else other than Mississippi, where we are so connected to our past. Uh, and we look for for signs of that past on our landscape. So I often think about how much um, we really do think about how how place. I mean, I think we have that we have a high octane sense of place in Mississippi, and I think that is largely because of our grounding as traditionally an agrarian culture. We don't have, have cities. You know, Zaire talking at the beginning about her immersion in the city. I live in Washington, D.C. part of the year. And that is a very different landscape physically than Mississippi. I'm engaging with the built landscape 
in a way that I don't when I'm in Mississippi. And that's a, and I think that's probably why our writers are so engaged with, with this place. You know, another thing that I found the connection when we were um, thinking about what this program, the, the, the beats that we would hit and talk about, and there's this, you know, wonderful uh, quote by Natasha Trethaway and from, from a poem where she's talking about, and you reference this in your book, you know, bring only what you must carry, a tome of memory, it's random blank pages. And I was reminded of the way that Walter Anderson worked. You know, when he was on Horn Island, he was using these eight and a half by 11 sheets of typing paper. That was his format, partly because it was only what he could carry. I mean, this was the um, the format and the medium that was most easily accessible to paint out on the island. But also he would even write poems on the back of, of this paper. And I think, of course, that's the beauty of what we're talking about is these connections that are made across time um, are not necessarily uh, ones, of course, that Anderson would have thought of. He died in 1965. But but these things continue to reverberate. And the fact that he's writing poetry on typing paper and Natasha Trethaway is talking about you know, these blank sheets of paper, um, it just gives us an opportunity to really make the connections in a way that um, ordinarily, if you're just looking at the art on the walls, you're not necessarily thinking about. And I think that's what the landscape can do for us. How do you think about that? Oh, most definitely. When the first time I read Theories of Time and Space, I what that poem did for me is it put me in a place in the past. It put me driving, you know, to the Gulf Coast, with my dad and remembering where, you know, Highway 49 meets. It's like this, and all of a sudden, the whole world changes. Um, I mean, there are, these, there are these places in Mississippi where you have these dramatic changes in the landscape. You know, if you go over to Charleston from Oxford, that dramatic drop off into the Delta. Um, and that's, it, it is this, this, these dramatic changes that we're always um, engaging with. I think we're constantly thinking about them, even if we're not, um, I think if you grow up here, it's very much a part of, of who you are. It's imprinted upon you from the very beginning. And you may try to lose it. You may try to walk away from it as I did, but it's always there, it's always with you. It never leaves. Well, to segue into our, our next segment, which we're, we're going to leave it here, but I just wanted to, in, in a few words or sentences, you know, we talk about the Southern landscape and, and in this case, the Mississippi landscape, but we're also talking about national themes. And what do you tell people if they ask you what the significance of Mississippi is to the national dialogue? You've you lived, of course, live in D.C., for part of the year and have worked in DC for a long time and and your purview is not just Mississippi, but there's a reason that you and others are still focused on this place. What, how would you kind of distill that about Mississippi landscape and the Southern landscape as a way to understand a national identity? There's often, you know, whenever I'm talking to people, particularly in, in publishing about something about Mississippi, I've, I've often gotten the response, that's a regional idea. And, I, and then I remind them that Malcolm X famously said, everything south of the Canadian border is Mississippi. And we can never really forget that everything. And I think that's what we have been struggling with this summer is that we like to think that these ideas of you know, racial hatred and, and this tortured history all exist within the borders of Mississippi but the borders of Mississippi are much broader. Mississippi is a way of understanding America. Um, it's, it is not just the South writ large, it's also this country writ large. Uh, and we must never forget that. I'm always, I'm always reminding my East Coast friends of that. And when they come here for the first time, they are, they begin to see what I mean and they, mm -hmm. They see this place in a very different way, and it, it changes them. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's take a quick break, and, and courtesy of Zaire Love, we're going to take a little bit of a, a trip back in time, and then we're going to rejoin uh, and pick this conversation right back up. You see this car? 
This car might have been driven in the 1950s and the 1960s when African Americans on the coast of Mississippi protested on the segregated beaches on a quest to dismantle the Jim Crow system of segregation and oppression. Let's hop in and take a ride to the weigh-ins. Way, 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 way in the water. Way, 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 way in the water. Wait in the water, my children. God's gonna trouble that water. Wait, These waitings were indeed wait, necessary. Wait, Gilbert Mason in his book, Beaches, Blood, and Ballads, resounds. Local practice reserved God's sunrises and sunsets over the glistening waters and white sands of Biloxi Beach for the exclusive enjoyment of white folks. For a man who loved swimming and who gloried in the free use of the parks in Chicago and Washington, D.C., the idea that a marvelous Oak Line public beach was forbidden territory was just too much to abide. Water. All right, we're back, Ralph, and and that's a, a good segue. <laughs> and Zaire, a beautiful filmmaker. I do want to bring a comment in from um, from our viewers because you and I have talked about this. This is a perfect example of the real and imagined. Um, you know, Willie Morris and and this the, the origination of this quote, and it certainly is very true. But but for those who who don't know. Um, you know about this 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 attributed Faulkner quote, which he very may, may likely may have said. Um, there's also a, a bit of uh, of, of imagined uh, quotation as well. Do you, can, you, can you fill oh, us in? Oh yes. Well, uh, that first turned up in a in a story by by Willie Morris, and he ascribes that quote to Faulkner. And we can't find any. I can't find anything that says that that's something Faulkner actually said. What I do think, and this is, you know, is widow Joanne Pritchard Morris said, you know, I think Willie thought Faulkner should have said that. And he just decided he should have said it. He probably did say it. He said it in his work, so I'm gonna make him say it. And that's that's one of the things that that Willie did as a as a storyteller. He saw that there were certain um, <clears throat> ideas that were part of our, our writers and part of our history. Well, someone should say that. And he'd say, you're the one to say that. And he, he famously ascribed other quotes to other people as well. Um, sometimes with their permission, sometimes not. Well, we're, we can relate to that. You know, we are shepherding and, and stewarding the legacy of Walter Anderson. And there's no more mythic Mississippian uh, than Walter Anderson. We don't know what he would think of where we are now, but his art is left to us and it speaks and we have to interpret it, but also just the, he was a myth maker of his own myth. And um, so it's, it's a fascinating thing. And I do want to talk about now um, turning the conversation to what Zaire opened up for us is this idea of how the land or our idea of the land, certainly our idea or our telling of the history of land is, is shaped. And you've um, written about um, this as well, talking about indigenous peoples and how they were the first uh, Mississippi storytellers. And so I wanted to, to talk about that. And also we'll talk about the weight ins, but, but tell me a bit about that, that history, because I, I think, you know, when we think of even the name Mississippi and um, so many of our towns and rivers and are named after um, taking, you know, taken from tribal languages and, and paying homage to a certain degree, but at the same time, at the expense of these societies who were very much forced out and many of whom um, are not here any longer, certainly on the Gulf Coast, when we think about the Biloxi tribe. Um, and Anderson painted the, these um, societies too in, in the 1930s um, in some of his his murals that we have here on, on view at the museum. So so yeah, how do we think about that? You know, we're shaping the land um, to a certain degree, but also the history that we're trying to live with. And how, what do we need to be thinking about? We also always have to remember that we are, we live on stolen land. I mean, we have to, I mean, that's, I mean, I just have to be blunt about that. And that, uh, I was talking with the writer Wright Thompson about this several months ago. I guess he's working on on something looking at the Delta. And one of the things that Wright said, you know how long it was between the time that they, that Indians were removed from the land and the time that they surveyed it to figure out what they were gonna do with it. So it was seven weeks. 
So the Indians had named these places. The Native people had named these places. So if you're kind of coming up with surveying this land in seven weeks, you're taking those names and putting them on the landscape. And those names have come to give Mississippi's literature, I think, its own um, its own sound. You know, thinking about Yacht, the Yachna River, Yachta Batafa. You know, and just think about just in my own piney woods. Um, you know, the you know the the Okotoma, uh, the Shukwatansha. They're all of these <clears throat> these names, even throughout the Gulf Coast. They're they're all native names. And that's, they are our first storytellers. So they, I think in a lot of ways, we have taken the names that they gave to this landscape and we have used it to create our own rhythm to what this landscape means to us. Yeah. And I think that's what's interesting with Anderson. I mean, he was borrowing from all these global cultures. And, and we're gonna tease this out later in this series of programs where we talk a bit about his um, his wide expansive source material, but he did feel a need to depict the past, although it was one that he was very much removed from personally. And you know his representations are important, but at the same time, they're his representations of, of these societies. And um, I think the fact that he's representing them is almost illuminating um, the lack of representation, even though we do see the names and we, we do have this um, this echo of the folks who were here before. Um, it only goes to uh, to punctuate the fact that what you mentioned where, uh, you know, this land was their land. And, and here we are, um, you know, in many ways, not even thinking twice about it, going past these road signs and, and going about our day. Yes, I mean, we, we do kind of we swing past them and we don't even even think about what it is that they mean but so often in taking that and borrowing it we are you know it it is part of our own myth making about place that um that we use these names and we create our own mythology about them and anderson did that in his art i think other visual artists from the south have have done imagining what it was like when these lands were occupied by by native peoples, not even having any idea of what what that was. Um, but I was also, I think, through through photography too. That's one way that we can begin to explore truths about about the landscape. A photograph does capture a past reality, as Roland Barthes said. We we can't impose. A reality on it that we can with a with a painting that the the act of the artist putting it there, but still even within a photograph you can see a tremendous truth. But over in the other part of the frame can also be something that's that's hidden, and also that means that image can also contain a lie as well. Yeah, and and, and the other thing I think about because um, we you know we we try to draw connections to Anderson in, in many ways in, in this Rachel Carson quote um, where you know, the, the famed environmentalist, Rachel Carson, talking about the, the pleasures of the natural world being accessible to everyone. And Anderson certainly um, shared that idea. Um, but at the same time, you know, to, to Zaire's uh, vignette that we watched coming into this, there was a period of time in the 1960s where while, while Anderson is um, exploring Horn Island and thinking about this cosmic reality, this, this place that was only a few miles offshore. Um, meanwhile, in Biloxi, you know, there's a, the, the, the desegregation of the beaches. And I think that is the, the immediacy of that is, is another way that we, you know, we really need to investigate the reality of this landscape and, and understand that just beneath the surface, you know, the, the, the dunes, the sand, the topsoil, um, there's this strife and, and also a resilience though. And I think that's the thing I wanted to, to kind of turn it back to a bit. And I want to hear your perspective on the Biloxi weight ends and, um, and also just this resilience, because even when we're talking about indigenous society and the native peoples, um, there is a resilience despite all of this that, you know, whether it's the Tunica Biloxi tribe, who's now in Louisiana, who, who we partner with and, and many others, um, there is, um, there's a fight happening between the land and ourselves, you know, sometimes intellectually, sometimes physically, um, but there is a way in which folks are and have and continue to um, overcome that and continue forward. Yeah, I mean, the, the weigh-ins are, are really fascinating to me because I've, 
I mean, they were happening when I was very small. Um, and what I do remember growing up is, you know, I remember Dr. Mason. Dr. Mason was my um, Eagle Scout sponsor. So when, you know, when I'm a teenager and meeting with him, I wasn't thinking about what it was that he did on those beaches. And it, uh, it, it makes him a larger than life character to me now. Also, you know, my encounter with Medgar Evers as a boy, I realize now was Evers being on the coast and coming back through Mount Olive, you know, visiting with a family there that was kind of his safe place to be on his way back from those wait-ins. And so piecing these, these stories together, um, but I can't look at that, <clears throat> the beaches without thinking about that. And then also, you know, reading Natasha Trethewey's Memorial Drive, I didn't know until reading that book that her grandmother participated in those wait-ins and that so it's almost as if there's every every event here that that happens we are somehow a writer has to make some some meaning out of it so we are we are trying to make sense out of the i think a lot of the the violence that happens on this that's happened on this landscape whether it's to native people or whether it's to african americans is how do we take the past, tell the truth about it, and add meaning to it? And that's uh, that's where the memory memory is so important to uh, adding meaning to these these places. So even you know, your connection with that tribe in Louisiana, I'm sure that there are stories that have been handed down through that tribe. So memory being a way of creating meaning and that connection to place it's that meaning continues over time. And I think that's the same thing that, you know, Natasha bringing that up, that her grandmother had that connection. It's hard to look at that, that beach for me without seeing Dr. Mason out there taking care of people who were beaten with, with clubs. And, um, and you know, the, this, you know, in his book, he says, the, the sand was actually stained with blood. And I can't look at, at it without seeing that. Yeah. And I mean, in the other, which we, we would be remiss if not mentioning, you know, the other force that is visited upon us all is, um, you know, what we'll, we'll call the, the violence of nature, or at least the force of nature and, and hurricanes. And here we are looking back on, um, you know, 15 years after Hurricane Katrina. And Anderson had a lot to say about storms. He lived through many of them. Famously, Hurricane Betsy stayed on Horn Island and and uh, felt the wrath of nature there and wrote about the um you know, the, the landscape as it was changed after the storm came in. Um, and, you know, we're, we're looking at an image now called after the storm. He talks about it as a, a bit of a house cleaning where he was finding all these things that had washed ashore from uh, Louisiana. And that's still the case with Horn Island where you get to see the detritus of America. Um, even when there are no hurricanes, it's still a collector of these objects. Um, but you, you've mentioned something about Jasmine Ward um, thinking about when Katrina came through as well. And, um, to talk a bit about how you think we might um, take this conversation and, and flip it to think about how nature then shapes us. Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons I began my book on the Gulf Coast is that that sense of renewal that I think that's that's kind of baked into the culture of the Gulf Coast because you can rebuild some of that landscape, but you know that in time that the forces are going to to change it. Uh, what I remember being with Jessamine in Delisle and asking her about the impact of Katrina on the landscape. She said, well, what's interesting about Katrina is that the landscape now looks very much as it did when I was a child, because all the things that, that had changed it over time, the storm surge washed away. And now it's she said, now I feel as if I'm back in this past reality here on the coast. And that, you know, and what she's very often doing is trying to find that past and the present. And some of that she's doing through this, you know, when we you know when, as I think it was that she said, you look at this landscape, you see it, 
see it wiped away. Very often we see ruin, but so often we rather we see that ruin rather than the renewal. And what I think both Jessman um, and Natasha want us to do is to see the renewal to engage with it rather than focusing on the the loss and the destruction. Not really abandoning the loss because we have to always grieve for what was once there. And that's it's appropriate for us to grieve for that. But also taking, take, if you can take the past, elements of the past, put them in the present and think about how they connect. You can really, there's so much of this place that you can begin to understand and engage with in a very different way. Right. That's beautifully said. Um, I wanted to say uh, something to those who are watching live. If you have any uh, questions for us, we are going to take questions in a, in a bit. So I'm, I'm curious to hear um, all of y'all weigh in on that. So please do throw those into the, the comments. And we're going to transition now to another piece by Zaire and the, the Jesmyn Ward um, discussion is a perfect segue. So uh, without further ado, an, another beautiful piece by Zaire Love. Before Delille was named Delille, after a French settler, the early settlers called it Wolf Town. Pine and oak and sweet gum grow in tangles from the north down to the south of the town, to the Delille Bayou. The Wolf River, brown and lazy, snakes its way through Delille, fingers the country in creeks before emptying into the bayou. When people ask me about my hometown, I tell them it was called after a wolf before it was partially tamed and settled. I want to impart something of its wild roots, its early savagery. Calling it Wolf Town hints at the wildness at the heart of it. I was sitting on the bleachers with Hilton watching Ronald play basketball with the girl. I was home visiting and it was a relief to sit in the park again, be still under the trees and the great heavy sky. Just right. gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> We're fortunate to have Zaire, you know, retelling this story again and, and spinning it off into, you know, through her own lens, but still, of course, you know, those words of Jasmine um, with, with Zaire's camera, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm going to pull in a few comments from, from some of our folks listening, uh, you know, talking about how growing up the, the weight ins were, we're not part of the curriculum in, in public schools. And I think that's another part of this um, history, uh, the way we, we imagine our history that uh, we have to always keep in mind is ha where do we get these stories? So often it's from our families, but it, it probably should be um, elsewhere. And, and shout out to the University of Mississippi and Southern Studies program that you're a part of, because that, that does a lot of that work um, for folks who wanna, wanna go through it. And um, here's, here's another from Susan to, the importance of sharing um, our stories, but learning from the other stories out there. And there are so many of them. And I, and I know for, for folks who live down here, um, the whole singing river phenomenon, um, you can do your own research on that, but it pays, uh, it's referencing, uh, you know, the Pascagoula uh, tribe and, and a lot of the, you know, some of the stories of, of how that tribe lived and, and the singing river name is something that you can't escape it's all over the place down here too. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing. And I wanted to transition a bit. We can talk about Jasmine and Natasha some more because those are two examples, certainly coastal authors, Mississippi authors, national authors, and, but they, this idea of public history, and we're going to also talk a bit about public art. So, you know, what do you think the, um, the function is of, of these folks who are, who are retelling this in public? I think that's, it's a distinction that I think is important to make, especially when we were talking about the, the public schools uh, with the Bluxy Wade in, you know, there's a there's people do, of course, need to learn from their families and this internalized, passed down oral history. But the public facing side of it is is something that we can always get better at. And the folks who are doing that for us um, should be lauded. Yeah, well, I think that the 
the public side of that with art, what we're often finding ourselves doing is um, we're we're trying to, one of the issues that, that we have, and this is something I very often talk about in my Southern Studies class, is we have in, in this country, not just in Mississippi, but in this country, a segregated cultural memory. And so often what we're trying to do in Southern Studies is to, to bring all those cultural memories together. And this is something that my students, if any of them are, are watching this, have heard me say probably a million times, is we tend to think of our the narrative of our history as being something that goes in a straight line, always ascending, whereas our, our history, our stories, they're very layered. They have a lot of layers and they're, they may go up, but they kind of they go up and down. And we have to have to reconcile ourselves with that. Public art so often has really tried to tell one story. And you know, um, you know Chimamanda Adichie talks about you know, her, her talk, The Danger of a Single Story, is that we tend to stereotype things or places, people and places, or we have only one idea of a place. And I think that's what we have done in Mississippi, a lot of it through our Confederate monuments. We've told a single story about this place and we haven't explored all the various layers, whether it is the story of the native people, the Wadens, um, you know, as I said, the Waden, I think have also been overshadowed by the Jackson sit-ins or that there were other places outside of Jackson in the Delta in Mississippi where people were engaging during the movement. I think most most recently uh, there's a book from University Press of Mississippi about the, the movement in Benton County, Mississippi, not a place we often think about as a hotbed of civil rights activity, but it existed there. And it, it's, a, it's a part of who the people in that county, that's how they see themselves. It may not be how people outside see them, but it's how they see themselves. And those stories, those layers, layers of stories are really important for us to engage with. Totally. And, you know, one of the, the things, and we're going to look at here at, at Hank Willis Thomas, um, his, his piece, Raise Up, because this is a piece of public art that is going to give us a, a, a window into some of Anderson's work. But you know, Hank Willis Thomas, for those of you who don't know, a, an amazing visual artist. And, you know, he said in an interview a couple things, you know, you know public art fundamentally is propaganda. Um, I think he was making a, a salient observation, but also that artists are civic leaders. And you know this this piece is in Montgomery at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And uh, Ralph, you, you took this picture. So um, as a way to 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 get into this conversation about um, some of Anderson's public art, talk to me about about that piece and and when you see it again in in relation to this conversation. You know how how are you thinking about it? Uh, I use that that piece in an issue of the Virginia Quarterly Review for um, an essay by Roxane Gay called The, the uh, Price of Black Ambition. And that piece of art really spoke to that, that idea of having your hands up is kind of that price of being black and ambitious. And when I went to the Equal Justice um, Initiative Memorial and saw that there, that's how I, I really connected with, he's, the public art really, I mean, that, I think that's a very provocative statement to say that it's it's propaganda. But what but I think what he's saying is that it it is trying to prov provoke us. It's trying to make us make us think. Um, and Hank also comes from a, a family of artists. His his mother is the photographer and photographic historian Deborah Willis. So um, it's part of a tradition for him. And there are other artists that I think about who are also getting us to think about what is the function of public art, whether it's Carol Walker or Kehinda Wiley with, with um, his sculpture that he had in, in Richmond. Um, I think it's Rumors of War. And <clears throat> he, he, I mean, Wiley believes that rather than having, you know, as these, as Confederate memorials are being moved He's not thinking we should replace it with something else. It's that that's an opportunity for artists to actually show their work. And he said, I, he said, I think something should be placed there for 
a tip for a short amount of time, and then another artist comes in and you get another point of view rather than only one point of view being there all the time. So again, being able to engage with it and letting, letting the artist have their say in a public space and then moving on to the next artist rather than focusing on just a single story. Right. And, you know, when we, when we talk about Anderson's public art, I mean, there's several, you know, we, we alluded to the, the murals that he painted for, during the Great Depression, the Public Works Art Project in the 30s. And then he also did the Ocean Springs Community Center. But one of the ones which is, I think, most fascinating is his sketch for um, a commission that was meant to be at the federal courthouse in Mississippi. And he did not get this commission. So we all we have is what Anderson called the cartoon painting for this mural. And when you look at it, you have a depiction of justice and um, and the arbiter of, of justice and, and all of these, the, the landscape he's depicting here. Um, if you look at it closely, there's so many things happening. I mean, there is the, the agrarian South, but there's also this multifaceted uh, collection of people, all of whom are in some ways uh, being reverential towards justice. And I think what's fascinating about it, and, and of course, you know, this story is that the, the commission that did get chosen was by a Russian born artist, Simka Simkovich, and it was a much more stereotypical view of the South and the hierarchy and uh, imagining um, a world which in some ways was real and existed in terms of its segregation and, and um, inequity, but also was imagining a future or certainly a justice that was not necessarily uh, true to the tenets of the nation. So, I mean, when we talk about these, you know, what do you see happening here? What, what are we, what are we meant to look at and see? Well, I think I, with that, that, that painting, the, the Simka Sinkovich, um, that mural, it is the idea of not just Southern place, but people in a Southern place having a place. And you know, when you look to the left there and you see the man with the banjo, you see the cotton, those are only black people there. And, and then the white people are at, are at the center of that painting. Um, and, and you see the, the different things that they are, it's as if the white people have a place, the black people have a place, and that justice is being meted out by, by whites. And the Walter Anderson image, which is, very abstract. There are even people, I think the, the gentleman in the, the, at the center of that, uh, in the red, is, looks almost racially ambiguous. And I'm sure that that ambiguity did not sit well with the people who were thinking about this. The other painting, which clearly defined the social divisions were in Mississippi and everywhere they would always be, is depicted in this painting, which is, um, it makes it problematic from a contemporary standpoint, but looking at it from, through a historical lens, what you see there is exactly the way that white Mississippians saw the world at that time. Uh, it's not the way we live now, but it does, it does depict um, the way that the way we had we had to find our caste system in this state. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I'm looking at some comments here. I want to go ahead and transition to our our, our last segment, which um, is a time for questions. So um, let's let's hit that segment. Are there any questions? Okay. Are there any questions? Any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, sir. So we've got a lot of them. Um, at least comments as well. And I've got some questions for you, um, but I'm just going to throw up some of these, uh, you know, these comments that we're getting. This is uh, Mary Anderson Pickard, who is Walter Anderson's daughter, who we're, we're glad to have joining us. Um, I, I know Deirdre from Jackson and you see uh, the, the Magnolia from this, uh, the proposed flag talking about reimagining our, our landscape, uh, the, the persistence of the Magnolia and saying that public art powers, the imagination fuels ambitions uh, for better or worse. So um, I do have a question for you, and, and we're actually going to pull Zaire back in for this one. Okay. So um, I think Zaire probably also has a question or two. So Zaire, have you been watching? Um, and uh, I know you've got, got some things that you probably want to ask Ralph, so, so go ahead. <laughs> 
Yeah, sure. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Ralph, honestly, when you sent us a, a portion of your book to read, the wait-ins was something that really drew me in because I had never heard of the wait-ins. We hear about, like, my classmate, uh, Mary Blessy, she actually... Uh, had a comment as well about not learning about this and she lived in and went to school in Biloxi. So could you like just expound upon that a, a little bit of for people like myself who who are a part of the, I guess, millennials, who, who might, you know, who might not, you know, necessarily know about it and how how much of an impact it was um, on the Gulf Coast and it, in Mississippi and how it really contributed to, like, I guess the a, a change in landscape, right? Because now we're able to go to the beach. I was in Ocean Springs with a couple of weeks ago, you know, and had, you know, no problem swimming, you know, so <laughs> could you, you know, could you, you know, just expound upon that for us? I, I think that the, you know, the wait-ins began in, I believe in 1960, maybe even 59. So they, they be, you know, people began that, you know, the beaches were intensely segregated. And also the, you know, what we often forget is the, that beach is the longest man-made beach in North America. And, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers created it. So, but there were also parts of it that were not quite equal. And the, the less equal part of it was what African-Americans were confined to. And Gilbert Mason, having lived in Chicago and in Washington, D.C., realized that I, you know, I should be able to use this beautiful public space. I live here. I'm a citizen here, and I I think that the the wait-ins really had a great deal of influence throughout the state. Um, there, I think they were probably talked about. Um, people who were involved in those wait-ins got involved in other things within the state, whether it was you know the it, movement in Hattiesburg up through Jackson, as I said, you know, Medgar Evers was involved with those as well. But it it changed the Gulf Coast. And I think that it pushed the Gulf Coast culturally in a way that I don't think that the rest, to a point that the rest of the state had not yet moved. Um, and that's what I always remember as a kid about visiting the Gulf Coast. It always felt different. It's something that that Jessman Ward talks about, she said, as, as a kid, she said, I was always told that anything north of Hattiesburg is suspect, you know, and that you know, this is a place that I really don't want to be. And for people from the coast, because Gilbert Mason did there, it it changed a lot of their lives. Um, and Mary saying that it was something that wasn't talked about, it's largely because it's a narrative we sometimes suppress and we have stories like that that we don't talk about for for a variety of reasons uh and the reason i think gilbert mason's one of the reasons the coast in some ways is very different than the rest of mississippi uh i mean something i often think about too there are two places i think that would have a great deal of influence on the the culture of mississippi the gulf coast and the other is is Natchez. I think if the state capital had remained in Natchez, we, our our culture as a state would be very different than it is right now. Rather than kind of moving to Jackson, the center of the state, right in the heart of the frontier, we really absorbed that frontier ethos, and that became the core of our our identity as a state and as a culture. I want to pull back in um, Mary Anderson Pickard, and again, this is the the eldest daughter of Walter Anderson and, and something she was talking about where, you know, basically saying that Anderson came to understand um, the, the, the tribes and the, the, the first nations peoples who were here prior to European arrival from some of the shards and artifacts he found. And because of his understanding of nature and this idea that the, that empathy was in many ways embedded in the landscape. If you were to understand that there were, um, you know, the animals, all living beings have inherent value and so forth. But I'm, I'm curious about that idea. And, and I want to hear, Zaire, if you have thoughts on it, too, about, you know, how how people who are, are separate from 
um, you know, who are, are once removed, if you will, from from this story. So Anderson, in Anderson's case, we're talking about finding shards of pottery, but there also are people who, you know, because of the nature of our uh, de facto segregated landscape, and although it's it's not, of course, fully segregated, there are people who, who don't know um, necessarily how the other half lives, to, to borrow another uh, quote. So I mean, how, how would you say, Ralph, that you know, people in this 21st century, when we are examining our own biases and just the world we live in, you know, if, if folks aren't steeped in this difference that we all, this diversity, uh, whether we're talking about biodiversity or cultural diversity, you know, there's a there's a perhaps a fear in, um, or certainly just a, a removal, a, a separation from people to people. You know, how do, how do we think about the landscape in that way? Yeah, you know, I, I would just add that when we're here in Ocean Springs, you know, the Biloxi Bridge is right next door. Uh, you can see the other side of the bridge, but um, while you can also walk across it, there's there's also a, a, a city state type uh, of separation even there. And so the people are inherently, um, you know, bound to each other, but also we live in a world where we can be pretty isolated. So how, how do we think about that maybe in, in terms of this idea of where we might go to make it a little more equitable and just expand our perspective a little more? Uh, I think to expand our, our perspective is to, I mean, one of the ways we can do that is through art. I mean, art really expands our perspective. I mean, I, I teach a class on uh, image of the American South. And basically we go through the history of photography, the South being the most documented uh, part of the, of the country and Mississippi you know, being intensely documented during the Great Depression by the WPA. And if we begin to think about the ways that, the new ways that photographers are engaging with our landscape, we begin to see a different truth that exist beneath it. We begin to ask ourselves different questions about what's there. I mean, they're thinking about, I, I often think about the work of the, the artist, Carrie Mae Weems, who will take a plantation house in Louisiana and place her black body in front of it to make us look at that space in a very different way. And I think that looking at the landscape is, when we're looking at it, we have to ask ourselves, not just to see the beauty, but also trying to understand some of the pain that might exist beneath it, as well as some of the conflict. Uh, and I think that's really what we've been talking about is understanding the pain, the conflict and the beauty, how they're all together. Again, that layering of things rather than the straight trajectory. Uh, and I think that's, is that what you're, does that answer yeah. your question? No, I think that's a great point. Um, it actually reminds me too of, of Titus Kafar, another wonderful American artist, um, African American um, man from who, who was did, got his degree at Yale and, and does work as he talks about in the aesthetic medium and tradition of Western art. But he recognizes that in that tradition, you know, that tradition had no place for him historically. And so he talks about, among other things, how this idea of beauty which he can find in the technique um, is a way to Trojan horse some conversations um, about the pain too and the marginalization. And so I think it's really fascinating when we can think about those two things, which is what we've been talking about the entire time, if, whether we're talking about hurricanes um, or just a, a beautiful landscape, there's so much beneath that surface. Um, so I think that's a, a wonderful point and artists are, are, are experts at doing that. And that's why we should continue to look to our, our authors and our artists and we do have a question here from from Mary um, talking about um, you can read it for yourself, but any thoughts on the influence of different immigrant groups on the coast um, comparing to other parts of the state? I mean, I think what one of the things she's alluding to certainly is the the seafood industry. Uh, we'll go ahead and pr uh, go ahead and t tag another future program that we'll have in this series. Um, but how the immigrant groups from all over the world, certainly in Biloxi, when it was the seafood capital of the world or when when that moniker came around, you had all these Eastern European um, immigrants who built that industry and, and served as laborers. And I think the day after Labor Day, it's important to recognize that. And then again, when, um, you know, in, the, in 1975, after the fall of Saigon, um, you know, you had the Vietnamese influence come in. And that's just such a wonderful cultural um, exchange and gumbo. And you see that manifest itself in so many different ways. But 
the Delta is a place that, where that's happening too. Um, but any thoughts about the, the other different immigrant groups? And I think we do get caught in a, in a black, white binary sometimes in Mississippi, just because it is such um, a big issue. Uh, historically, it's part of the story. It's the, it's one of the through lines that and the, the indigenous population, but there's so much nuance in that fabric as well. Well, it's interesting this, this uh, semester in my Southern studies classes, we are talking, it's a, course on Southern memory and identity. And one of my, my students is of Vietnamese descent. And what she is, has talked about is the way that she engages with plates is very different than some of the narratives that we are, are reading where we see the black and white binary, yet she still identifies with them because they also realizes that there are times when she has, because of the way that she looks physically has been placed in the category of being white. How that binary, what she sees is how that binary works. I mean, I mean, you grew up in the Delta. You, there were the Delta Chinese. There are the the Lebanese. Um, there and when there there were the Jews along the, the river towns. Um, you know, so Mississippi is a very diverse place. I mean, we have tamales in the Delta. Why do we have tamales in the Delta? Because in the 1930s, um, which Marion Post Walcott documents for the WPA, there were Mexican immigrants working in the cotton fields there. Um, and they brought that food with them. And they and then it stayed. And, and then we took other, you know, rather than using masa flour to create it, we started using cornmeal because that's what we had. Uh, everyone, so it all, changes. So we do have to, one of the things I try to do in thinking about that binary, which I think is very much a way that we look at Mississippi, it's interesting to me trying to get my students to think beyond that. To And it's wonderful having a student who is Asian, who recognizes the ways that she's been made to fit in that binary, while at the same time realizing she is not a part of it. And yeah. it's something we, it, that... In, it's it's a it enriches the conversation. It truly enriches the conversation. And what I wanted to um, just chime in on, in addition to the art, the first question that you asked, Julian, I just wanted to chime in as far as like, in addition to the art, like history, and we're talking about that right now, the the suppressed histories that Mississippi has, you know, and only hearing one or like the, the majority of one. And hence why we have this uh, kind of like a monolithic or binary uh kind of understanding of the landscape. However, if we begin to explore these histories and ask um, these diverse communities, give these diverse communities a voice to tell their stories about their their Mississippi and how Mississippi has shaped them and how they their culture has, you know, shaped Mississippi and, and in a way that Ralph just talked about, you know, the Mexican immigrants coming here to work in the 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 cotton fields, and now this is why we have Delta tamales, you know, in which we eat all the time. So being able to really um, hear these stories, whether it be us writing those that down, me as a filmmaker capturing that through film, someone like Walter Anderson painting those, like really giving voice to the commu communities by acknowledging the history and like making sure that it's there. Well, yes, I think it's 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 engaging with that history and recognizing it. One of the things that I'm always taken by every time I go to the Emmett Till Interpretive Center um, in Sumner is that it's that it's housed in an old Chinese grocery. Um, those groceries, there are very few of them left, but it's but it's there. We have to, as a as a state and as a as a place, we I think embrace all of these stories, uh, and rather than keep, I think we have I think there there are two types of memory that we have. We have memory that fits within our racial binary in the state, and we also have. Um, Others that that's that's been layered with mythology, and you know, myths are very important ways for us to understand 
difficult aspects of a culture. So what you know, Claude Levi Strauss says, but where they become problematic is when they obscure what's real. And that's a that is very much an issue for Mississippi. And I think that's why I feel such a a commitment as a writer to try to uncover those stories. And as I said at the beginning, I try to explore those silences. And within those silences, there are other ways of thinking about, about people and place. That's great. Um, you know, I wanted to hit on something that I think is, is taking it back to, to the collection that, you know, that we live with every day, the Walter Anderson artwork that's all over this museum, all over the South from Athens to Little Rock. You know, if you think about the block prints and, and just the way that he thought about the world, you know, he is gone, but this philosophy in addition to the objects remains. And this multiplicity of stories I think is very important. Um, it's, it's the contemporary art that's being made now, the, the writers who are, who are making, um, you know, new, um, who are trailblazing new paths for us. But then you also have the, the folks who left something behind, just like the shards as artifacts. And I think Anderson's philosophy of interconnection um, persists, even though he could not foresee this day that we're, you know, sitting here talking about um, him or, or he couldn't foresee the 21st century and, and understand that we could even be having this conversation um, from remote places, but still finding, you know, common ground. And so I think it, in that way, um, he, his artwork opens up these, you know, these narratives, or at least the possibility for more narratives to fill in the gaps. And to, to your point about the silences, he also uh, was a master of negative space. And he also said, you know, imagination uh, fills the space between the trees. So there's a lot of space between the trees uh, to be filled. And I think Zaire uh, making the point that other narratives um, can come in and fill those spaces. And Anderson, whether he intended it or not, has left us those spaces to fill. And there are many people in Mississippi and beyond whose stories um, appropriately should fill those. So um, I want to give you all last word. Uh, anything you want to leave folks with or um, tag it before we uh, we conclude? I, I, I think what I would really like to, to close with saying is that I know that in, in the academy, we focus a lot on this idea of intersectionality, but and thinking about how all these various identities and ideas cross over with each other. And I think when we're we're thinking about art, place in Mississippi, I would urge people who are watching today to to try to think of it through that lens of intersectionality. I think that's what Anderson was trying to do in his art. I don't think that he had that that was part of his lexicon but it was clearly something he was beginning to think about. Now we have a, a word for it. We have um, a, you know, a whole idea and philosophy behind it. And I would urge people to kind of look at the intersection of, of ideas and people and place in Mississippi, that layering and the connections between all those various layers. Yep, that's wonderful. I appreciate that. That was beautifully said. Zaire, anything you want to leave us with? I would just say as um, scholars, as people who are interested in the arts or artists, just using the, the work or our times to create art that could, that is, that can be, um, integrated in such conversations as these, you know, as an, as a filmmaker, as a, a writer, it's just like the, it's important for us to capture what is happening now so that we can have these conversations long after we, you know, go on. And so I just, I just really think that this, this, these, this has inspired me to create art and to create work in such a way that we can continue to have conversations that push, you know, us in a, a direction that makes it a better world. And your, and your work does that so beautifully. I mean, I'm, I want to just tell you, I am so, was so moved by how the various pieces really fit in with the conversation. Um, and, you know, you got my, my head bobbing right there at the beginning, I got to tell you. So thank, thank you. you.
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Well, I, I'm actually going to give the last word to uh, to Wendy Jo Ledbetter, who's joining us, and, and she makes a, a good point, too, that we'll, we'll turn it back to the land before we leave here. Um, just talking about how I think um, Anderson would agree that that, you know, art and nature merging those together um, also gives us opportunities to see, you know, in, in nature, the the biodiversity, the the species, the processes, the systems that, uh, you know, that the creator uh, has has made um, that, you know, the landscape that we live in. There's a lot to learn from that. And I think that the intersectionality not only of um, of areas of uh, of social life, but also just between different sectors of study, you know, all, all of us on Earth here are, are working towards hopefully some uh, some more cohesive and, and peaceful world. And I do agree that the conversations like we've had today with, with folks like yourselves is, is a big part of, of how we get there. So Ralph, thank you so much for joining us. Zaire, thank you. And, and uh, we look forward to seeing y'all soon. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. All right, everybody out there, we'll leave it with another bit of musical sound from Fifth Child and Zaire Love. Show.